Hello, Winning Investor Nation. Ian and Amber here with your weekly Monday Market Insights webinar. Thank you again for tuning in this week. And as Ian and I always like to say, please remember to give us a thumbs up as it helps support the channel. Plus, please click the subscribe button and that bell to be notified when new video content is posted. So good morning, Ian. Good to see you. How are you this morning? Happy Monday, Amber. I'm doing well. It was a oh. nice weekend. Summer's winding down. It certainly is heading toward that Labor Day holiday, fast and furious. Mm -hmm. So, but last week's annual economic policy symposium in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, we saw that Fed Chair uh, Powell actually made three distinct remarks. Mm -hmm. uh, remark number one is that he sees the U.S. economy's underlying momentum actually remain strong. So this means that the Fed will likely keep its policy tight for the foreseeable future, and it will not will not prematurely prematurely loosen its policy. Um, number two, that the Fed is unconditionally unconditionally committed to bringing down the inflation number, which means raising rates is really their only tool to combat inflation and curb expanding the money supply. And number three, uh, the Fed will not cut interest rates in the middle of a recession, uh, which you, Ian, have shared that we're likely in right now. Um, mm -hmm. So with inflation likely above target, like it was in the 1970s and 80s, they don't want to repeat that type of uh, action. So as I shared in last week's uh, video, where future interest rate increases are concern, a uh, Fed Chairman Powell's decision will be data dependent. So we're looking at those economic releases. And once he sees economic data showing that slowdown, uh, then the Fed will actually take more of a, we call a dovish type stance on rate hikes. But for now, in the near term, uh, we'll be watching September's FOMC meeting, right, Ian? Um, we'll see. We'll likely see a rate hike between 50 and 75 basis points. Is that what you're foreseeing as well, Ian? Yeah. And if you look at the rate hike probability odds, uh, they've pretty drastically increased over the last month. I just want to pull the probabilities up for everyone to show you what I'm looking at. So these are the target rate probabilities for the December 2022 meeting. So this is basically where the market is expecting that the Fed funds rates will be at that time period. And if you look, the thing that's important to me is at the bottom of the chart, you can see that the 300 to 325 and the 325 to 350 probabilities one month ago on the right side were 32.3% and 50.1%. And now, today, they're basically less than 10% odds. Mm. Uh, and what that means is basically the max that the Fed was expected to do a month ago was about 100 basis points. But now it's it's looking 125 to 150 basis points. So it looks like the market is adjusting to another rate hike or two. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that over the last month. The big move from the last month, and, and the reason why these changed was that the jobless or the jobs number that came out for July jobs that came out in early August was double expectations. Mm. And I know you're going to talk about this in a moment mm -hmm. that the we have the jobs report coming out on, on Friday, so we should get into it now. And the expectations are low again. And it seems like, you know, maybe the economists didn't really learn anything from last month where the expectations were low and the number came in double. Mm -hmm. um, so let, let's talk about that number right now, Amber. Of course. So in the U.S. economic calendar week ahead, we actually have the jobs report coming out on Friday. Mm -hmm. And we have another interesting number coming out tomorrow, just as an aside, the JOLTS number for job openings. And mm -hmm. what I'm, I have found that of all the U.S. economic indicators, I was reading something in Bloomberg, Ian, and they're speculating that Chairman Powell will actually be placing more weight on developments in the labor market, in that jobs number on Friday. And if jobs uh, data does show some strength, then we're actually looking at that 75 basis point hike in September. I just want to rewind a little bit and talk about what uh, Powell said on, on Friday, because I mm -hmm. think it's really important. Um, you know... What the Fed does is not as important as what the market believes the Fed's impact is. Mm. And I think that the worst case scenario would be the market believing that the Fed has really lost control mm. um, and can't cause an economic recession and then can't revive us afterwards. Mm. We still ha are in the the what I call the golden age of central banking. Basically, you know, the Fed for the last 14 years since the great financial crisis is the only game in town. You know, the macro is what matters. Uh, all these different liquidity programs 
uh, or, or what matters. And what the Fed has done essentially is create a way in order for them to accumulate assets, take assets out of the market, which allows investors to start investing in further out on the risk curve. So what I mean by that is the Fed under QE went in and bought government bonds and mortgage bonds and then corporate bonds later on. And in doing so, it caused pension funds and insurance funds to actually move into higher risk assets, which had sort of a ripple effect. Now, I think the way I think about inflation, and I, I know I want to be sensitive about this because I know many of you have dealt with this before. Inflation is like a cancer in our economy. Mm -hmm. And what happens is it starts to metastasize initially normally in energy, and then it starts to spread. Transportation costs go up. So then those shippers start charging surcharges on their goods. Um, you know, Input costs all go up. And so companies that are making things start raising prices. And what the Fed is trying to do basically is – um, a form of, of, you could think about it as chemotherapy, right? So they're trying to put the economy in this recession, make it sick in order to tamp down inflation. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, in the cancer analogy, when patients go through chemotherapy, they get really sick, right? And, mm -hmm. and we see this in the markets. The markets sell off. We're down at 1.30% in the NASDAQ this year, 20% in, in the S&P 500. And so what the Fed is doing is getting rid of inflation to get rid of the cancer or, or raising rates, cause the economy to go in recession, get rid of the cancer that has started to metastasize. And then eventually, you know, when the economy goes into recession and inflation starts to subside, it's going to give us a stronger path for growth in the future. And so it's basically like, you know, taking your lumps now, feeling really sick, going through this, this treatment, and then eventually it, it, things will get better further down the road. And, what Powell has done and indicated on Friday, even though the market doesn't like it, obviously, and it feels like a lot of rain on our parade, mm -hmm. uh, is going to be better for us in the long run because you don't want another scenario where just things are getting out of control and you know the meme stocks are going up constantly. Mm -hmm. we, we want investors to to remain honest and to be wary of risks, and and we, we want to see. A, a little bit of recession, which I think we're already in in the economy, right. mm -hmm. um, but I don't think we're going to have this, you know, full blown credit crisis like we had in 2008. Mm -hmm. Balance sheets are corporate balance sheets are much stronger right now than they were then. The banks are in much better positions. You know, the the, the homeowners are in better positions than they were back then, where it's like you know you don't have people taking out five mortgages and buying all these different properties. Mm -hmm. um, so you know everybody believes that every recession is going to be another financial crisis when really that was only a once in a century thing. So I think we're going to see a slowdown, a recession. Inflation is going to subside, especially towards the end of the year when the comps actually get better, uh, and then we'll you know sets us up for an amazing spring of growth and another bull market this decade. Mm, perfectly said, Ian. Really, it gives us such a positive outlook for something that may seem a downer at the moment, but there's a mm -hmm. bright future ahead. And I can also add, Ian, looking out to 2023, uh, expectations still anticipate a 25 basis point cut or two by the end of next year. So that's mm -hmm. we are where we're headed. So just hang in there, right, Ian? <laughs> <laughs> so for this two shall pass, Amber. This two this shall, two pass. shall pass. Oh, well, well said there too. So for the U.S. major economic releases this week, uh, we have several. It's a chock full week. On Tuesday at 10 a.m., we have the Con uh, Conference Board of Consumer Confidence for August. At that posts, um, estimates are showing a slight strengthening, uh, strengthening with this number as gas prices have fallen in previous weeks. And on Wednesday at 8.15 a.m. and 9.45 a.m., August ADP of employment change and MNI, Chicago PMI, which is the Chicago business barometer, actually posts. So the Chicago PMI is expected to uh, remain relatively unchanged with a possible slight uptick. So that's something to watch. And on Thursday, the August prints for the S&P Global U.S. Manufacturing and PMI and ISM Manufacturing post at 9.45 a.m. and 10 a.m. respectively. And prints are to be relatively unchanged with the slight softening and the ISM manufacturing number coming in at 52. But 52 is still indicates an expansion in that manufacturing uh, market. So with this index, anything 
a reading over 50 indicates an expansion in general for a manufacturing segment of the economy. And also in helping the August ISM number will likely be the auto market of all markets. Hmm. As a, there's still a backlog of car, of car vehicle sales, demand is still there. And that's really underpending production. And of course, on Friday, we've already covered the jobs report that's coming out. But there's uh, two more things coming out on Friday. The factory uh, and factory orders as well as durable good orders will be out around 10 a.m. And th those are relatively unchanged, uh, but we'll see when that when that data forecasts and posts on Friday. Well, I guess we're not having a uh, you know light calendar week to uh, wind down the summer here before oh, Labor Day. <laughs> oh, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's be a busy week. Um, okay. Busy week, Ian. So, Ian, I had we had actually at our from our last video, we had a couple of questions come in for you on the crypto market. So, I thought we would try and get to those today, if that's okay with you. Let's do it. Okay. So, Ian, we heard from John C. And John C. would like to know your thoughts on Cardano. So whatever you want to share. It's a curveball there. Hey, John, thanks for the question. Um, so my thoughts on Cardano. So for many of you not familiar with Cardano, it was founded by one of the co-founders of Ethereum, this guy named Charles Hoskinson. He's a very charismatic computer scientist. Um, and Cardano has been around, I think it's about, it's about 2017. So it's, it's up there in age with Ethereum. Mm -hmm. This is a very hyped coin and it gets a lot of retail support. They do a really good job marketing this. But in terms of the development that's happening on Cardano, and let me just also preface this by saying that Cardano is known as a layer one blockchain, which means that it supports smart contracts like Ethereum does, like Solana, like Avalanche, that you can actually build new types of protocols um, and and new uh, types of cryptocurrencies on top of. So it's basically like a building block, right? So think of it like as a Lego or a Lincoln log or you know, or, or an Erector set, something that you can actually build new things with. Mm. Um, Cardano is always a very hyped coin, um, but it just, you don't see the type of development on the chain that you wanna see to invest in it. So I focus on Ethereum primarily, which has the most amount of development and Solana. There might be a niche for Cardano for Cardano in the future. You know, I know I hear a lot of people saying that it's uh, supporting all these different money systems in Africa, and and that might be their niche. But in terms of you know, would I invest in Cardano, especially at this price? No, I wouldn't. Um, and I know when I say these things on YouTube channel, I wind up getting a lot of hate mail. That's okay, mm -hmm. but I just I just don't. I'm not a Cardano fan. I'm not a Cardano bull. So, but thanks for the question, John, and um, hopefully. Uh, you you heard what you were looking for. Okay, thanks for answering his question, Ian. We have mm -hmm. one more question from Linda C. Uh, Linda C. just wanted to know, is the next gen coin part of Ian's crypto service? Yes, um, and I think we know now the next gen coin is Ethereum. Mm -hmm. um, it is the most important cryptocurrency in the world today. It's going through a huge... Um, upgrade right now. And one of those milestones is going to happen in mid-September. So we're going to see a lot of volatility around this. And what's going to happen in Ethereum is going from proof of work, which requires miners and lots of energy uses, to proof of stake, which essentially you stake your tokens, you can earn rewards for validating and securing the network, and it speeds up transaction speeds. Now, Ethereum is not going uh, from where it is now to its final state in the next month, there's going to be a bunch of other upgrades that are happening over the next few years until we get to Ethereum's final state. But this is a, a big development. You're, we're seeing a lot of volatility around Ethereum right now. But I think in the long run, you know, this volatility will prove to be a buying opportunity when you see how many use cases will be built on top of it. And I do think that Ethereum should eventually surpass the market cap of Bitcoin. I think over the long run, Ethereum is going to be the most valuable cryptocurrency in the world just because it has so many more use cases than Bitcoin. Mm, okay. So thanks for that question, Linda. Oh, yes. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Linda. So anyone, if you have a question that you'd like to have answered on the next of uh, our Market Insights video next Monday, uh, please post them below in the YouTube channel comment section, or you can email us at winninginvestordaily at banyanhill.com, and we'll try our best to get to all your questions. So Ian, mm -hmm. I have a question for you. <laughs> Okay. A crypto related question. So I was reading an article in the Evening Standard and the Evening Standard is reporting that nine in 10 high net worth individuals now invest in digital assets such as cryptocurrencies. 
or land in the metaverse. So this is according to, to a new research study. So mm -hmm. my question to you, Ian, is, is as this number is just showing an overwhelming uh, saturation of high net worth people in crypto, how do you see this working out for crypto in the long run? Uh, does it affect it in any way, its adoption or just overall popularity even more so? Great question, Amber. Um, in terms of the metaverse, I think from that survey, it said one in three high net worth individuals mm -hmm. are invested in actual land in the metaverse. Yes, in the land. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, so the metaverse is like, um, it's it's a catch all term. It, it describes mm -hmm. many different things. To me, the metaverse is really just, you know, our digital lives, our digital selves, that could be your Facebook profile or Instagram profile. Mm -hmm. That's already part of the metaverse. But then there could be another terminology, which the metaverse is basically a world that you can enter into. So think about a lot of these you know, games that the kids play uh, where they're moving throughout this world, interacting with other players that are connected to them online. And in those games throughout their existence, mm -hmm. uh, the digital objects had no value. They only had value inside that specific game because you know they could easily be replicated by the game maker. But what crypto and blockchain is allowing us is to actually have what's called provenance for those assets. So you know you could make sure that a sword in a game only has a limited amount and you could verify that this digital item that you own uh, is part of that collection. And that that's really what NFTs are all about, having a unique digital item that you know can exist in the metaverse or some digital landscape that you can verify who owns it uh, and, and also the fact that it's genuine and not a replica. Mm. Um, I think that the, the metaverse is potentially the next big computational platform mm -hmm. uh, because when you think about Facebook, for instance, right? They have a website, they have Instagram and they control lots of attention. People spend hours a day on social media. And what Zuckerberg is doing now is he's committed $100 billion developing his own metaverse, where he's going to take his basically 2.5 or 3 billion users and move them into a new platform where instead of just scrolling through their timeline and feed, you'll actually be able to enter into a world where you can you know, interact with friends in ways that weren't possible before we had augmented and virtu virtual reality. And so I think more than what high net worth individuals are doing, I think it's important to look at kind of what Facebook is doing. I know Apple's also working on uh, augmented reality and VR goggles. Mm -hmm. Google has their own lenses. So I think the next computational platform is something that is going to sort of bring the metaverse either into a virtual world or into a reality. And when I think about that is, you know, you have goggles and you're walking around your daily life. And if you look at something, that physical object can have a digital replication mm -hmm. and you can automatically pull up information on it, such as, you know, what is this building that I'm looking at right now, you know, or, you know, the, the, how old is this tree that I'm looking at? There, there, there are already apps that do that where I, I point my phone at a, a tree and it tells me, you know, what, what kind of species the tree is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that you'll have more interaction and information sort of at your fingertips uh, through this. And the metaverse is going to be a big part of it because it, it really is the the layer between our physical world and our digital world. Sometimes it's it's all the digital world where you can buy, you know, sort of these digital land and digital landscapes. But it also the metaverse is, is kind of that level uh, where the digital world meets the physical world. And that's why, you know, I'm, I'm a big bull on the metaverse. Uh, just the term and all the different types of companies that are enabling this reality that we're coming, you know, in contact with in, in the very near future, if not already. Right. Um, so thanks for that. Thanks for that, Amber. Great question. You're welcome. I love hearing your answer. Thank you for such a comprehensive answer, Ian. Metaverse, a megatrend to watch. And actually, speaking of megatrends, I have some megatrend news to share with you and everyone. So Elon Musk... I can say has disrupted yet another industry. Uh, this time it's our cell phone communications in. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually right now, about a half of a million square miles remain uncovered by cellular, net cellular networks in the US, but 
all that may be ending very soon. So if you're a T-Mobile customer, please listen up. Uh, last week, Musk and T-Mobile CEO Mike Sievert announced that SpaceX is working with T-Mobile to completely eliminate cellular dead zones. Uh, the companies claim to quote, Next gen uh, satellite, uh, Starlink satellites are set to launch next year and we'll be able to communicate directly with our phones, letting us text message, make calls and potentially uh, stream video even when there are no cell towers nearby. And what's more in in interesting is Musk has promised that this is all possible with phones that people are using today. So there will be no need for consumers to have to go out and buy anything extra, no extra equipment, et cetera. So as reported by The Verge, uh, this is a very bold uh, proclamation from T-Mobile as Verizon and AT&T uh, actually don't offer anything like this yet. So I think it's pretty cool. What would you say, Ian? Satellite. I mean, I think it's incredible. I mean, mm -hmm. you know what Elon's plan here is mm -hmm. you, in order to have autonomous vehicles, you have to be able to connect to the cars in real right. time mm -hmm. anywhere they go. And so could you imagine, you know, being in a self-driving vehicle that all of a sudden loses his internet connection, right? Uh, we, we can't have that. So this is a necessary step, I believe, into the true real world adoption of AVs and all these you know, new technologies that need instant real-time communications. Um, I have Verizon, I'm a little jealous that T-Mobile is doing this because I know I'm gonna be doing a long road trip soon and there's a lot of dead zones. Uh, and so, um, I think that, that that's a huge win. And I would also note there are other companies, specifically one that we've invested in in our small cap portfolio, that is looking to compete with SpaceX to deliver internet from the sky. Because if you think about how big the internet is, I think it's a $30 billion a year uh, in revenues um, you know, to, to provide internet service globally. And we could be looking at a world where we get everything from from satellites where you don't need to have all these clunky structures and infrastructure built uh, on the land. It just beams down from space and, you know, you don't have a, a telephone pole running through your backyard or anything like that. No, no. And what an exciting time to, to be living because we're seeing something that's happening now that will just create a whole nother market that's forthcoming, which is the AV market and autonomous. Exactly. And, and I just want to add one more thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have about 8 billion people on this planet and uh, about 50% of them don't even have an internet connection. No. But, you know, our our children, our children's children are going to live in a world where every person on the planet will have access to the, all the world's informational resources, right? And and that means that you're going to find, you know, child prodigies that solve physics equation in like random villages in India in the future, you know? And it's just, it, to me, it makes me so much more optimistic on humanity when every single child in the world is going to be able to access the types of education that was only once reserved for a very small uh, segment of the global population. So to me, that that's very exciting. And I think, you know, one of the reasons why morally beaming 5G down from space is, is just so essential to the future and the health of our planet. Mm, beautifully said. I love that. A beautiful future ahead for our, for our youth. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. So Ian, I just have to say, um, if you have, well, if do you have anything more to add before I say this in one next item? Um, I think we've covered a lot. We've covered some mega trends, some crypto, mm -hmm. some economic data. Uh, no, go ahead. Okay, because I love how you mentioned your small cap service. And mm -hmm. also want to mention to everyone to really get Ian's perspective on his next recommendation, which is in his September strategic fortunes issue. This recommendation that's being revealed, we can say is almost like uh, it's like the brains behind like the next gen world. It's like the hidden brain power of next gen uh, communication, just in, in innovation. So to make sure that you get the stock ticker for his recommendation, everyone, as soon as it is released, which is this week, uh, please sign up for Strategic Fortunes newsletter by clicking the bull icon right here over my shoulder and get all those details. So Ian, yes, I think we covered quite a bit today. Always good to hear your perspective on the world. So enlightening. Appreciate. Oh, thank you, Amber. It's great, great talking to you today. Oh, of course. So we'll be back next week, everyone. So until then, I'll say goodbye. Have a very safe and productive week ahead. And Ian, I'll leave it to you. All right. Goodbye, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in.